completely changing the size and shape of the opening, creating a tremendous impact on the resonance pattern. E O As we watch these images, notice how much the upper lip, when rounding, can stretch forward, all the way from under the nose. Notice, too, the variety and subtlety of the different positions. And keep in mind that each position changes the size and shape of the hollow tube and consequently the vocal sound. For example, notice that the position of the lips in relation to each other can be adjusted, whether one is more or less forward than the other. We can appreciate the lips' contribution to our wide range of vocal sounds by imagining the way we would sound if we had just one single opening that never varied. Now, let's turn our attention to the soft palate, also called the velum, the gateway to the nasal cavities. The soft palate is a soft part of the roof of the mouth and is connected to the hard palate. It is fleshy, springy. It functions like a valve, opening and closing the passage to the nasal cavities. In this position, it is closed. Now it is open. Now closed. Now open. Here is the consonant M, as in Mary. Notice the soft palate is lowered, allowing air into the nasal cavities. And since the lips are sealed, air can only come out through the nose. Look at the amazing shape of the vocal tract tube for the letter M. Here is the shape of the vocal tract when the singer sings N, as in Nancy. Again, the soft palate is lowered. This time, though, the tip of the tongue seals the mouth by pressing against the alveolar ridge. Here is the shape of the vocal tract. And here is an NG, as in hang. This time, the tongue connects with the soft palate to seal off the air passageway into the mouth, directing all air into the nasal cavity. Since the mouth is not part of the resonating tube, we see a dramatically different size and shape of the vocal tract. The normal position of the soft palate is low, but for speech and singing, the soft palate is generally raised, dipping down every now and then to produce a nasal sound or to be used as part of a vocal technique. Because the soft palate can be higher or lower, even while closed, it affects the size and shape of the curve of the vocal tract, consequently affecting the overall hollow tube and the resulting sound. The final shaper of the air column is, surprisingly, the head. Movements of the head affect the upper and back wall of the vocal tract. Watch here, for example, along the spine. Notice as the head tilts how the spine moves against the back wall of the throat, adding its shaping qualities to the hollow tube. Now watch both the spine and the hard palate as the head moves. See the whole head and spine is a unit. See the jaw and larynx as another unit, moving independently, shaping and reshaping the vocal tract. Obviously, the movements of the head have a subtle, though often tremendous, impact on the whole vocal tract. One reason, posture, figures so prominently in vocal pedagogy. To summarize, the vocal tract is the resonator of the voice. As the air inside it vibrates with the vocal folds, it creates the quality of sound we hear. 
Its size and shape can change continuously, and each change will produce a change in quality of sound. A change from one vowel to another is an example. But singers are interested in finer changes because the color of a vowel's sound, the timbres, the shadings, are all influenced by the nooks and crannies, the subtle widening and narrowing, which can be created anywhere along the whole vocal tract. These varying shapes are created by the singer, moving all the parts that line it, the lips, the tongue, along with the jaw, larynx, spine along with the head, the hard palate, and the soft palate, which can open and close the nasal cavity. And each of these are deeply interrelated to the others. Some of the movements are so subtle that they must be developed unconsciously, guided by a desired sound quality, or by feel, or by mental imagery, or sometimes by sheer experimentation. Certainly by avoiding unnecessary tension and gripping habits that interfere with free and flexible movement. But regardless of the method to train these movements, in the end, as singers, our task is to exquisitely control all the parts that line the vocal tract, to finely tune the shape of the air column, to master the slight flexible movements so that we can produce the finest vocal sounds possible.